with us this morning. Uh, so Ken, it's always a pleasure and a delight to have you, Ken. I want to ask what you're, what you got. Tell us what you're up to, Ken. Other than preaching in all the venues around the past few. That's it. That's, <laughs> that's a really Thank you so much. 
for the work that is led and acted and started in a double edged sword in banking, that it speaks to our heart today. It's alive. We, we stand on the authority of Scripture. We believe in the word um, that was written uh, New Testament 2,000 years ago, but it's very relevant to our lives today. We, we thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit on our servant. Can and pray for more uh, about anointing for this for a time such as this. And we do thank you for our brothers and sisters in the world, and we thank you for that, the heart to, to do kingdom work, to, to be about your mission and ministry there in the forest of Zoom and pray. Even with those who are a rich blessing upon those folks that they need in the name of Jesus. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 The Bible verse, or tablet, whatever, uh, turn to 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. This is Peter writing at the end of his life. Uh, he's writing to stimulate the church at Rome. 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, verse 1. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, 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 called to be an apostle uh, so let's read from 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and our Savior Jesus Christ have received the faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and the truth of our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness to our knowledge of him, who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desire. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is near sighted and blind, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome in the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus, Savior Jesus Christ. So I will always remind you of these things even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this tent of this body. He goes on to talk about his imminent death. We, we look at the world differently, all of us. We have a perception uh, of the world that is determined by the experiences we go through in life. If we suffer grief, then we look at life differently. If we suffer through illness for a period of time, we learn something of God that we wouldn't have learned before. The experiences of rejection or times of great sorrow, we then see the world differently. And yet God calls us to come before him and to find in him the true nature of who he is and in that respect of who we are. There was a comment that I read in the week and it was this. It is the end of our comfort, the end of what we know has come to an end. And I think this reflects the way that people view our world today. They see our world in a way which is different to the way we see it in many years ago. We are living in secular times. It is interesting when Jesus is writing. He's writing at a time when the folk are really up against it. 
they really didn't want to teach that they were persecuted. So I say, just to be a Christian, you were persecuted. I mean, an author by Nero and what he got up to. But in the second um, letter of Peter, we see Peter talking about those that were surrounding them that were worldly, they were sexual and their thinking, they were humanistic, Chinese that were being introduced, almost to the fact of denying that Christ came into this world, let alone died, and rose again. What Peter was doing, he said, I want you to be mature. I want you to grow up in the Lord Jesus Christ. He begins with history, and he ends with history, and there's nothing about that. And at the end of the letter, he says, we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. To grow up in him. And I believe that the Lord would say to us that we need to be mature and strong in him, and to trust him, not just in big aspects of our lives, but the little ones as well. I just want to dissect some of these verses here, just to help us understand. That verse which says that this divine nature has given us everything for life and God and us to our knowledge of him. And we do need our faith to be increased. We do need to grow in our faith. We do need to grow in health. We do need to grow in patience. I know that. We do need to grow in affecting one another. But to grow in the grace of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and to know that His divine power has given everything to our lives, that means He has given us everything to every aspect of our lives, no matter what we are going through. The very fact that He has His divine nature suggests that we're participating with God. And then he goes on to talk about the outworking of that relationship. Just last week, as I said, we were encouraged and reminded again of the power of the Holy Spirit that came at Pentecost. And we saw then when Jesus reminded the disciples, he says, I want you to wait until you receive the power that comes from the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses in Judea and and the utmost part of the earth. And that word power is going to get our word dynamite. And I think it's important that when we use these verses here, His divine power, His divine dynamite has given us everything we need for life and godliness. It comes through our knowledge of Him. It comes through growing up in Him. Growing up to his word, meditating on it day and night, allowing it to take control of our thinking and the very aspects of our very nature, so that we live it, we walk it each day. And it's interesting, this is Peter writing, and I think that, yes, he, he had his problem. He was the one who denied the Lord, but he was the one who the Lord destroyed. He was the one that walked on water. This same Peter at the end of his life was wanting to commit himself to the king, saying, This is my final word to you. I hope that's not much, isn't it? This is my final word to you. Um, I want you to be nervous, I want to remind you of it, I want to stimulate you in this. Because this divine power is vitality. It, it, it springs us out of bed in the morning. It gives us something to go for because we have it. We've not earned it. We've been given it through the grace and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. This power, this focus on God, is, is a sort of God-centered living each day knowing that God has given us everything from us. If you've got your Bible there, you'd like to stand with me. I want to just go to John chapter 17. John 17. This is Jesus praying for his disciples. So he also prays for us. And I believe that he is still praying for us. So he never lives to intercede for us. John 17. And the verses uh, I'm referring to are verses 20. And uh, thank you very much. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those 
who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now I know that some over the years have said, what is the kind of unity that the Zion Church is coming together in agreement? But I think it's much more than that. The oneness that Jesus has with the Father is a oneness that we have with the Father. We have that access to God and Father and the Father. And the reason we have that is because we're saved by grace. And it's not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. And we can have that direct access to God as Jesus did. If we have that access to God as Jesus did, bearing in mind that Jesus only said and did what the Father told us, we can do our lives in exactly the same way. We do as the Lord can do, and we speak as the Lord can do. Right? That is part of the divine nature. That's about participating in him. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, where Paul is praying, and he's praying that an incomparable power of God that raised Jesus from the dead is that same power that we have as well. You see, I think sometimes we don't live in the victory that God is given us. We live in the conditions that surround us rather than the ones who sustain us. And I think it's absolutely fine that we live in that divine power that God has given us. What a wonderful thing. I, I, I know that American preachers come here to get to the other we're all gods and we have to have a correct and stuff. But we have the God name to win us. If we have that God name to win us, each day as we allow his words to grow in our hearts, we become more like Jesus. And as John says, we can do things that he did and even bring to them. And this is mind blowing when you think of it. We are absolutely mind blowing. That power that we have enables us to resist the enemy that comes against us. That we can stand on our own. What somebody once said, if we don't stand in our faith, we won't stand before them. Our faith comes through the word of God and hearing what God is saying. To participate in that divine nature is a moral guideline that keeps us on straight and narrow. Since Jesus speaks of two ways, he spoke of the narrow way, he spoke of the broad way. The narrow way, of course, leads to life, but it's difficult for many to find it. But many are on that road to destruction. I was talking the other day to some day, and I said, what would you regard as normal? What is normal, he said? How does normal exist within the Christian community? Because we have this divine nature. We don't live the normal pictures uh, of life. Of course, it's the sense for those in authority. And you know, I'm sure not. <laughs> You're going to have to want to be by the anyway. <laughs> but you know what I mean? That's in a sense that we submit to what God says and what we don't. That moral excellence is so important to God. That's when we see our faith in Jesus' name. And when we speak, they hear the very words of God. We transform them. And that's who we are. That is how that's good to be in it. The next part is quite interesting because he speaks about the promises. And um, he says this, through these he has given us his very great promises, precious promises so that through them we might make participate in divine nature and escape the corruption of the world. What are those promises? <laughs> well, first of all, that promise of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. There were those at that time that were denying that this was ever going to happen. In fact, we really didn't do where 
as Jesus said, to show the other feet sometimes, because that's the best possible way. To go the extra mile to to love our enemies, to be prepared to take the rough with the smooth, but to hold the very fact that we participate in the divine ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. To know that he is coming back very soon to believe us. If you see the Heaven of Eye Prayer, the Panorama program for praying for Armageddon, you know, in the end of you have a look at it. The truth about the evangelical Christian influencing the political arena in the state, and how they're doing all they can to support themselves in what uh, it's doing there now. I'm not here to talk about that situation, not at the moment anyway. But you know, they want Israel, let's see, they want Israel to get, because they believe that the Lord will come back and they believe that the second coming will come. They believe that Jesus will come back and he will stand on the Mount of Olives. And by the fear of this way, that is urging the Lord to come back. But of course, the Bible says we will never know when he will come back. We just need to be prepared for one day we come to the glory of God. Until then, we anticipate in his own nature. And we work that out through our past living. And we've done another blessing God and being absolutely committed to the cause of the Lord. Thank you. Maybe uh, David prayed earlier that I seem to find a thing to find it. But maybe some of us here today are telling that we have these divine names. You know, we, we have the knowledge of salvation. But are we assured of something? When we look at the word of God, is it? Are we living in this? Are we growing in the purity? Lord, we want that purity. We want to grow up in you. We want to become the country. We want to be changing our society, not the violence. And Lord, we are to be sitting down with the Holy Spirit. First, we will power to overthrow him, but when we speak, we speak the very word of him. Lord, empower us to overcome those situations that we face that are challenging beyond them. But to know, as the Tom said, that we can come against the truth, we can share the war. Thank you for your word. May it rest in our 